Welcome everyone. Uh, today I'm here with uh, Richard Schwamm, who is a senior partner at Halitzer Pettis Schwamm. Uh, he's a senior partner up in, in the Orlando office. And it's my privilege to interview him and really just discuss his story. He's got a great story about overcoming adversity as a child and, and rising up and becoming a great trial lawyer. So uh, I had read this story about him and thought it would be great to interview him and uh, spread the good word about Richard Swam. So with that, Richard, welcome. Thank you, Raleigh. I'm humbled to be asked to talk today. I'm looking forward to our chat. Wonderful. So let's just you know, get the, the perfunctory question out of the way. Tell us a little bit about your practice, the type of law that you practice. Sure. Uh, again, my name is Richard Schwamm. Uh, our law firm is called Halleck, Sir Pettis, and Schwamm. We are what folks refer to as a catastrophic injury law firm. We have an office in Fort Lauderdale, we have an office in Orlando. Most folks say, well, what does catastrophic injury mean? And that is a civil case that involves serious injuries or significant damages. So a lot of it is medical malpractice litigation, but it's also other cases of wrongful death and serious harm. Um, we just celebrated our 25th anniversary. Um, best friends with my two senior partners and the other folks who have working with us. And I'm really proud to serve the entire Florida community doing what we do. Awesome. And it is a great firm and you guys are heavily involved in the community and we're grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, so look, you are a big, passionate uh, advocate for children who are hurt. What motivates you? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, see, when I was a young lawyer, I was a grinder, right? Whatever a young lawyer does, you get a job at a big firm, you put in the 70 plus hours a week and I focus on that. Um, and when I became a dad, all that changed because it really gave me a chance to reflect on what's important. It gave me a chance to spend more time reflecting on my own childhood and the forces that drove me to kind of get past some of the obstacles we're gonna talk about today um, and realize that you know I, I'm more than just a lawyer and a grinder. I can be an advocate, not just for um, the benefit of insurance companies, which we used to do a lot of, but really to help people that needed help the most. And in my view, um, my greatest joy comes from helping children and families that have been harmed. So that's kind of the general overview of what got me here. And I'm looking forward to working through some of the details that got me here as well. So uh, I know that as a child, uh, you had severe stuttering issues as well as a lisp and, uh, and you were bullied. So uh, talk about that and talk about the, the speech therapy that you went through, which didn't work for you. Right. And then what you did to empower yourself to overcome that. Yeah. So, you know, when I was in elementary school, middle school, um, and even getting into high school, um, I was a little geeky kid, kind of chubby, um, but a very, very bad stutter and a bad lisp. And I could not get over it. Eight years of speech therapy did not help me. Um, the joke is that, you know, when Richard would speak, people would put their raincoats on because I would spray. <laughs> spray the room and you know I was the kid that would know the answer in the class but wouldn't raise his hand because if I got picked and I had to give the answer I would stutter my way through it and I would get ridiculed because kids are cruel so this is back when if you had braces or glasses you got ridiculed now my daughter's had braces and glasses and has never had a bad word said about her so I, I hate to play victim but it was it was rough um it wasn't easy and it wasn't until um I got fed up with failing in speech therapy. And I kind of had that conversation with myself of, you know, are you gonna to continue to be this kid? Or are you gonna find a way to overcome? So I started to work hard to overcome that myself and went through all those exercises that they tried to make me understand and appreciate and said, you know what? I, I need to work harder. I need to do something different. And gradually I overcame the stutter and I overcame the lisp and it wasn't overnight. And then when I overcame that, I realized, boy, I got a voice. Um, I, I haven't been heard much over the past eight, 10 years. Uh, and then when I entered uh, high school and had a chance to take a class on street law uh, and had a chance to see what lawyers do and had a chance to kind of play lawyer, that's really where I found my passion. So talking about that, that's a perfect segue. You know, finding your voice, uh, that gave you confidence and you went on to uh, do mock trial team. Talk to us about that whole process. Yeah. So, you know, as a lawyer, as I reflect back on it, everyone overcomes something. You know, folks have been abused. Kids have stutters or lists. Kids come from poverty. 
and either you can kind of get stuck there or you can kind of grind and persevere and overcome. So my, my way of doing that was once I found my voice and I took a class and realized that there was going to be a trial team. It was the first ever Tri-County mock trial competition. Uh, Dade, Broward, Palm Beach. Sounds like a really big deal. Right? I think there were 16, 18 schools. And there are four people on a team and there were four people in our school that tried out for the team. So whoop, I made the team, right? So my, my role was cross-examination and I really got a kick out of whatever the factual scenario was. I don't really remember it much. But my job was to cross-examine the witnesses during this competition. And lo and behold, we got to the finals. We had a big courtroom at Nova Law School. My parents were there. We got a bunch of judges up there. Judge Corda, I remember, was the chief judge in charge of the trial. And it was really cool. And my turn came up to cross-examine the key witness who was one of the students. And she was supposed to keep her line straight and the story straight. And I'm cross-examining her and she slips up. She makes a mistake. And I went after her like a bull in a china shop or a pit bull breaking through the fence. And I went after her as aggressively but appropriately as I could to the point where she literally broke down in tears on the stand. And I remember this endorphin rush, this just high. And I walked back to the table. And I said, wait a minute, I can make people cry for a living and get paid. I'm in. Boom. Done. And at that point in time, I knew I was going to be a lawyer. And we won. And I still have the plaque adorning my uh, wall up to this day. Um, and I don't really have anything else up on a wall but that one plaque. Because uh, I'm probably most proud of that than everything else. That's a great story. You know, um, your journey, you, you know, you start off as a kid that's bullied. That marks you. You know, I, I, I you know, I, we grew up at the same time. We're kind of, you know, yeah. same age group. And so it was brutal back then compared, I think, to nowadays how uh, kids would mock you for any little thing. Um, and uh, so you were able to overcome that. Uh, and you learn to fight the good fight, right? Uh, tell us about how that translates to today and when you're fighting that good fight to get that measure of justice for a child that's been seriously injured. You know, when, I, when our firm decided to really focus our practice on you know, catastrophic injury cases and I became a dad and I said, you know what, how am I going to spend my time? And I had this passion to help children. I started to volunteer um, for a local um, child safety organization here, became a natural spokesperson for safe kids about drowning prevention, anti-bullying, all those kinds of things. And I just said to myself, you know, there's got to be more that I can do. And as our practice transitioned to helping families and helping children, that's where I really appreciated that I could do something maybe better than I thought I could ever do. So we said we're going to have a low volume, high value practice, helping families that have suffered the worst of the worst, children that have been injured, parents that have died too young due to negligence. And then you just start to kind of get geared back up and realize that, you know, I'm 55 years old this year. Um, I didn't really need any more motivation to work hard. But when we transitioned and became plaintiff's lawyers and handling cases like this, boy, I really got re-energized in our practice. So by not taking a lot of cases, we can really focus our attention on the cases we have. And we think that separates us and allows us to do an even better job. So I just think that fire in your belly, when you really got it, um, I'm not slowing down anytime soon. Um, and I'm just constantly looking for the opportunities to help those folks that need it the most. So um, definitely those experiences, when, when you're helping a kid, you know, when you're helping a family and do you sometimes see yourself in, in the struggle? I mean, do you kind of remember yourself as a child being that, I don't want to say unfortunate child, but that child who was going through a difficult time. And unfortunately, sure. these kids are going through catastrophic things. You know, there's, there's, they're never going to be fully themselves again. Right. Right. So yeah. So, tell me about that, please. Yeah. So so you have some cases where you represent a child who's been sexually abused in a foster care setting, for example, and you, I've never suffered that type of abuse. I can't even understand what that would be like, but you can certainly understand how helpless that child feels and how taken advantage that child is. And that's the kind of case where you know you're in the right. There's not even a doubt when you accept a case like that, that your client deserves 
justice. And you've got a very weighty responsibility to do that, help get that justice for that child. And then you get a case of a child that's been the victim of medical negligence. And you look at the parents and you look at the struggle and you say to yourself, and it's kind of humbling, you know, I thought I went through a tough time, relatively speaking to the folks that we've been able to help. I've got nothing in the world to complain about. It's humbling when you see brave parents with children that have unimaginable challenges and then overcome them. So those are the kinds of things that when you help that family, and you're able to get them a recovery and you say to yourself, that child will want for nothing. They will always be taken care of. The parents can rest assured that when one day their time ends, their child will have a trust fund of money to take care of them when they're gone. And then you get the letter every year and you get the picture of the family celebrating Christmas and you get to see that child grow and that family unit more stable. And you know, you played a part in making that happen. That's really why I enjoy doing what I'm doing. Richard Schwamm, uh, former child that was bullied, that was stuttered to a giant uh, child advocate, passionate, uh, helping children find justice. Leave us with your final thoughts, sir. You know, as I think about everyone trying to overcome what has afflicted them, whether it's illness, whether it's abuse, whether it's injury, everybody has to find it from within them to persevere to move forward. And sometimes you look to others that can lend a helping hand. I mean, can you lend a hand down and bring them up? And that's what we should be doing as lawyers, because lawyers aren't just litigators. We're advocates, we're counselors. And if you don't use those tools of the trade for that purpose, I think we have all lost a valuable opportunity to help our community. So that's where I intend on spending the rest of my career, focusing on those people that need our help the most. My friend, thank you for your service and thank you for uh, spending some time and just chatting with me today. Thanks, Bradley, so much. I really appreciate the chance to see you again. You take care of yourself. You too.